All right, so this is Building Breaking Blockchains with Merlin Corey. Merlin is a software and systems wizard with a penchant for cryptography and security who loves to share knowledge and ideas with anyone who will listen. Professionally, Merlin is currently working as an engineer for a blockchain security focused startup called Candleblocks. Please welcome Merlin to Shotgun 2018. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I was ready. Okay. So, as you said, I'm Merlin. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about me, I'm a bit of a crypto nerd. Uh, I'm a Null Space Labs key holder. I hang out at Layer One in the ha Hardware Hacking Village with my lady kitten there. And uh, you can also see me at DEF CON and Tampa Evident Village. Um, I'm all kinds of places. So, you know, find me around. So, for this talk, I have some basic assumptions, which are that you have some cryptographic fundamentals and a vague idea of what cryptocurrency is, at least, and a uh, passing familiarity with Python or another language. However, if you don't, it's all right, because we're going to take a little quick little lesson to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. So the most important part for the cryptographic fundamentals is going to come down to hashing. Uh, Hashes are a one-way function where you pass in data and you get essentially a unique identifier as a very large number. And we have certain properties of hashes that we really care about. Uh, ideally, we want them to be fairly randomized so that you can't predict them. Uh, we also would like it if hashes had no collisions so that two inputs did not ever have the same output. And uh, you know, for that, we'd also like a large amount of space for our hashes. Generally, uh, you know, you might think of a cryptocurrency as magical internet currencies. You might think of it as, say, a pyramid scheme. You might be super hype on it and think it's the future of all the things. Um, really, it is, though, actually kind of a bit of a really slow database, and there's a lot of different applications. Not everything has to do with you know, currencies and, and monies. People are doing all kinds of experiments, but most of what you hear about is definitely gonna be around the currency token side of things and everyone getting rich going to the moon. So whether you're in that camp or you wanna see everyone fail, this talk is relevant to you because you want to protect your stuff or break everyone else's stuff just for the lulls. So, you know, I'm speaking to everyone here. So for basic programming, uh, essentially, if we look at this first line here, track A is going to be equivalent to some room. There's a puffer fish on the outside, so there we go. I'm Merlin. I'm equivalent to a speaker. And for each attendee in this room, I'm hoping that you're going to listen to me. Uh, and then now, you know Python. Basically, Python is almost exactly like this pseudocode. It's that readable. So if you don't know programming, if you understood that, now you know programming, congratulations. All right, so there's a whole lot of articles out there uh, and some prior art, uh, so I would be remiss in, in not mentioning that. Uh, for example, this first GitHub link is to this guy's uh, example, Learn Blockchains by Building One, which he wrote a nice little article in 2017, um, and it makes a nice little web application, so you can kind of play around with that. Uh, the one below it is a much more extensive, complete coin, so to speak. Uh, it has all the bells and whistles of a real production blockchain. And if you want to experiment with stuff, I would say it's a pretty good basis. Uh, however, it is unmaintained for the last few years, Python 2, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, take it or leave it. So with that, the question is, how hard could it be? And this is pretty hard, to be honest. but we're going we're gonna to keep it as simple as possible and take our time. And of course, at the end, feel free to ask me any questions. I'll clarify anything I miss, missed out on or went too fast. So from a high level, we've got transactions, which are kind of the basis of blocks. So a transaction is generally going to be some kind of exchange between one or more parties. Um, However, as we'll see when we look at the implementation, it could be any random thing that your virtual machine will implement, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, 
Each block is going to be made up of a group of transactions. Generally, every block needs at least one transaction. In, say, Bitcoin and classical type of blockchains, that one transaction is going to be what's called the Coinbase transaction. We'll talk some more about that. Uh, a blockchain is essentially a graph or tree of said blocks where you have a chain, thus blockchain, of blocks referring to previous blocks. And uh, a node is essentially going to be a miner, uh, a device trying to mine new coins, or say a wallet where you're tracking your coins and sending them around, or whatever the blockchain may do. Like I said, blockchains don't just have to be currency, but they often are. Um, ah, I keep switching windows. <laughs> uh, so a little more deep on transaction. Transactions are typically made up of inputs, and they point to outputs. And as I said, there's a special transaction, which is a Coinbase. So a Coinbase transaction, going back up, is the transaction that, that actually generates the currency. So what distinguishes a Coinbase transaction typically is that it has no inputs. It comes from nowhere. It's just generated. So it's basically just a list of inputs, where the stuff came from, and outputs, where it's going to go. So to create a coin, you just have no input. It comes from nowhere. It's magic, magical internet currency. <laughs> So a block is uh, generally you're going to have all your transactions in there, and you're going to sign them in some way. Typically, we use a Merkle root or a Merkle tree. The root of the Merkle tree, specifically, is what's used to kind of give you a nice small hash of all of the transactions in the block without requiring uh, extended processing for people verifying, I, th I think, is the main uh, motivation there. Ah. Let me uh, restart that. See, there you go. That was, that was the time. <laughs> All right. So also, there's generally going to be some kind of proof, which is how transactions are verified. Other nodes on the network can take a new block that's on the chain and essentially look at the proof and very quickly determine whether or not that block is in fact valid and met all the criteria for the blockchain. So that's how confirmations and such work is other nodes on the network are doing that work using the proof to confirm it. Uh, and most importantly, you have the parent block because without that, you do not have a blockchain. So as I said, blockchains connected by parent blocks. Uh, this is just a you know, very straightforward list of children on into infinity. There should be no limit, even in, say, Bitcoin, where the currency stops generating new coins, there will still be new blocks. It's just that those blocks will no longer have a Coinbase transaction. That's going to be the main difference. So nodes, as I said, we're speaking mainly of miners and wallets. Uh, you, as a consumer, you'll have essentially a wallet node. Uh, if you're trying to mine coins, you'll have a bunch of GPUs or ASICs or whatever it is for what you're mining. And those are all going to have their own sets of public and private keys, which is another important part of cryptography uh, that's based in all this. That's one we're going to touch on a little less directly. Uh, but essentially, if you understand, say, SSL or SSH keys, you have some familiarity with asymmetric crypt cryptography. So what is the actual network? The network is just this abstract collection of all of these nodes who are in connection with each other, all of the blocks, and then the protocol that defines what exactly makes that chain. So one of the kind of issues that not a lot of people necessarily talk about that I hear that I would like to expose is, for example, in Bitcoin, there's no real standard of what that protocol is. You have to kind of discover it based on the implementation of Bitcoin. So there's no like RFC standard that you can go to and read like what a block should look like. You have to basically look at the code and if they make a change, you have to make the same change. Uh, and by the same token, as I said, the network is made up of the nodes. So obviously, the developers have a lot of power. But so does everyone running 
the nodes, if they choose not to update to a new version of the code, it doesn't matter what the developers push, right? So there's a little bit of you know, opposing forces going on there, and that's kind of what's happening in the Bitcoin world with the whole like size of the block issue you may have heard about. All right, so we're gonna look at our first little bit of code. Uh, I wish I could zoom in a little more, but it's pretty straightforward. So here we're defining a function called make transaction in it. Or sorry, make transaction input. And the important parts about this function are that it will receive a previous transaction ID hash, a previous transaction ID index, and some blob of data, which we're gonna talk about in depth a little bit more. Similarly, for the outputs, we're gonna produce a dictionary based on a value and another blob of data. So what are these blobs of data? In Bitcoin even, there's a virtual machine. It's not as extensive as say Ethereum, where they have like a whole range of, of, of virtual machine uh, language stuff and like facilities like memory, so to speak, on the blockchain and things like that. It's much more simple. It's more like a basic calculator, so to speak, and it has very few instructions. The main instructions are, as you may have noticed, in this output, it doesn't say who it goes to. That's because who it goes to is a script in the virtual machine language. And there are other things that you can do in there. For their example, there's kind of like null-ish uh, commands. Uh, I believe op return is abused by a lot of people to do, say, data hiding in the blockchain. So essentially you can send a bunch of data to nowhere because your script won't tell it where to go. Which means you can use that for other purposes, for other applications. And that's also kind of the basis of, say, side chains and such. Uh, they send data to special addresses and, and special scripts and the coins are then moved to the side chain. All right, so we've got inputs, we've got outputs. Now we can make a transaction. A transaction is pretty much literally just a list of the inputs and the outputs. There should always be at least one input and one output, uh, but there could be more. Uh, you may, hear, may have heard of, say, uh, multiple outputs or multiple signature type things. There's, there's a lot that you can do here. It doesn't have to be one to one, it can be one to many. Is, is kind of what I'm saying. You can set, take from one input place and say I want to send it to three different outputs, for example. And that's kind of why you need a Bitcoin client. You may have ever wondered like, why do I need a Bitcoin client? Because it's got to handle all the scripting language stuff and create programs on the fly. So as I mentioned, the Coinbase transaction is simply the first transaction in a block and it has no inputs. So here we've encoded that very much straightforwardly. We've made a function called uh, make transaction Coinbase. It receives a value and, oh, I went a little far. Thought I was in the other window. Um, so it receives the same value in data. So that says, you know, how much we're gonna generate. And then um, it has no inputs, as I said, most importantly. Uh, also, we make a special function here uh, just to make an empty transaction, which we're going to see why that's useful very shortly. Uh, and that's just pretty straightforwardly making a transaction with no inputs and no outputs, which is generally invalid. So real quick, I want to look at, um, which one is it? Five? I want to look at some hashing, just to make sure, again, like I said, that everyone is on the same page. So in Python, there's a nice little library called Hashlib that you can import. 
I'm going to make a little convenience function here called SHA2, which if you've ever used, say, the Unix shell or bash shell or whatever, there's usually a command similar to this that'll just take any random data and give you a digest. That's this little bit. Uh, so for example, if we send into SHA2 the string test, we get this unique identifier. If we do it again, we get the same unique identifier, which we can verify by asking Python to tell us if the SHA2 of test is indeed the same as the SHA2 of test. Uh, if we do the SHA2 of test zero, we get this value. And if we do the SHA2 of test one, we get this value. And notice how very different they are. Even though the inputs were just different by one character, almost every character in the outputs is different. So that's kind of what I meant about the randomized property of hashing being very important. Uh, so finally, if we take a bit more complicated data, say your bill of rights, we can see, hey, here's the top 10 bill of rights. I'm gonna make another little convenience function, which is gonna take a pair of data, because I have a short version and a long version of each write. And that's just gonna make a SHA-2 of both of those together. And so now, I'm gonna write a nice little loop. Uh, this is very straightforward code where we say, hey, we wanna hash all of these writes. Uh, I'm gonna make use of a convenience function in Python that will easily let us enumerate them. Uh, and then for each write, I will enumerate it. So we can see the hash for one here is this guy. So just kind of driving the point home, all very much unique data. And it's repeatable. This is just a different way to write this loop. And we know it's the same for the output. And yet again, another way, same output. So hopefully, we're all 100% on the same page with regards to hashing. The reason why is because, oh, I wonder if I can start it from, oh, I see, it's already going somewhere. Nine? Um, hmm, okay. That's, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> perfect timing, perfect timing. <laughs> Let's see if I can just cycle it. No? Ah, there we go. All right. <clears throat> so with all that in mind, we're going to come back a little more concrete again. So I make a little function here to just turn any random Python data into something hashable. And most Python data structures are hashable already. Oh, I went too far. Uh, and so we just return them as is. Otherwise, we'll convert them to a string, and strings are hashable. So then I make a little function, SHA-256-digest, exactly like that SHA-2 function. And it makes sure that data is hashable and returns a digest. And then I make this little interesting function that we're going to look at in depth in a minute called SHA-256-digest-reduce. And the purpose of this is to take a list of SHA-256 values append them together, and create a new one. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to sign our transactions with a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree, essentially, if we start here at the bottom, these are the data blocks. So each of our data blocks is going to be a transaction. So we will hash each of our transactions, which will then allow us to take each pair of transactions and hash them together, and then each other pair, and so on and so forth, until you get one overall hash value. And as we saw before, each hash is unique. So essentially, this is a unique identifier for all of the transactions. It's pretty clever stuff from this guy named Merkle. That's why he got a tree named after him. <laughs> so. This is one of the more complicated functions that we'll look at. And this is my calculate Merkle root function. And it has a nice little doc string, which explains what it does. Um, I will also explain what it does. Ooh, that's my notes. <laughs> All right, so 
essentially, as I said, you know, when we were looking at the diagram there, we're going to take each of the hashes into pairs, or sorry, we're going to take each thing, make it into hashes, and then take each pair of hashes and move up and up until we get exactly one hash. So that is why we made an empty transaction thing so that we can hear, oh, I'm so expecting it to let me select it. Uh, so here at this line, uh, we test to see first if there's any transactions, and if there are, we break transactions into pairs padding with empty transactions. So if there's one, three, any odd number, we're gonna end up with an even number, it's just one of the transactions is empty, which is no problem for us because that's our algorithm, that's our protocol. We've now specified our blockchain protocol in code. <laughs> um, oh, and I have a debug print here. Nice. That's a, that's a good time for that. <laughs> um, so uh, once I uh, have made sure that I have an even number of transactions, I then hash each of those individually. And then while I have more than two hashes, I consecutively make a new list of hashes by using that digest reduce function that takes a pair and makes one, or takes any number and makes one. We do that to collapse it. And basically, we end up with this tree. So the final value, after we're sure that there's only two, is the root. We return that root, and boom, we have our signature. Uh, so the, uh, can you repeat your question? I just want to make sure. I know. Every time you add a new transaction, is this recalculating that top half? Ah, or okay, I get it. Yeah, so the question is, every time you add a new transaction, do you keep recalculating this? And the answer is, at least in my implementation, no, because transactions are uh, part of the block. So you don't get a block until you have a complete list of transactions. And so you will only calculate that root once, in, in my case. Uh, so we'll look at that in a second. <clears throat> um, and actually, yeah, for, for that, uh, let's see. Okay, yes, so that is the next slide. So now this is the next most complicated bit, and this is the mining process for this blockchain that we've invented. Um, the idea is that uh, we calculate the Merkle root first. That's the very first thing we do. We calculate the Merkle root for all of these transactions, and then that will be included in the block here. So I have an elided function, uh, make block header, that just receives a bunch of data and returns to you a new structure. One of the most important pieces of that data is, of course, the previous block hash and the root, the Merkle root that we talked about. Uh, and then a little bit later down here, where we start the making of next block, that's where we add in the transactions. So we merge this header, which has the header data, and then we add in the transactions to the end so that they're all in there, and they're signed by this root, so that can then be ver verified by other clients, right? Like if I tried to make a fake transaction go into things, it would need to have a correct Merkle root. Um, a little bit, yes. Uh, we got one. We got a couple more steps here. Uh, so there is also involved in it a nonce. So each block is going to have a particular like secret value that's somewhat public, uh, in that it's included with it. And what happens is you need to find a hash that combines in some way their nonce and your nonce, which in my case, I just add one to it. 
So let's say we're mining the Genesis block, right? The Genesis block, its previous nonce is going to be zero. It's not going to have a previous hash because it's the first block. Um, and usually you'll do something cheeky like the only transaction in it will have some like news headline in it with the date. So you can prove like my blockchain was created this day. Um, <clears throat> so we need that nonce, as I said, and we need a difficulty. The way that difficulty is defined in this blockchain and in several others is basically the output of your hash. Remember we looked at the like the bill of rights, each each one had like a different long string. The output of your hash needs to have a certain number of leading zeros or some other value that you decide it's traditionally zero. Uh, so in this case, for the Genesis block, we start out with a difficulty of one, which means it needs to have at least one leading zero. So you take their nonce, you take your nonce, you mix them together. In this case, I just add them together in a string. And oh, bug in my code. Uh, oh, no, I didn't. It's right there. <laughs> and you add in the proof, which is just some random data. So their nonce plus your nonce plus some random data equals a new hash that has some number of leading zeros. If it has enough leading zeros, you have found a correct block, which means now you can push to the other nodes in the network saying, hey, I found a new block. It's got these transactions. It is this difficulty. Here's my nonce. Here's my proof. Now other nodes can go and they can run the same transaction. They can take your proof that you gave them. They can take the previous block's nonce and your nonce and they can get the same hash. And they can say, yes, correct. That is a good block. Now the next thing is what determines the blockchain if there are, say, multiple people who find the same block at the same time. And that comes down to longest chain wins. However, uh, it's slightly a misnomer because they actually mean the chain with the largest amount of difficulty summed up. Because otherwise, you could make a bunch of really, really small blocks with few transactions and low difficulty and just kind of spam the network and just take over, right? So basically the difficulty is always rising and there's usually some kind of timing factor where you say, uh, you know, we want to generate X number of blocks an hour on average. So every thousand blocks we're going to check and we're going to see how many we generated. And if it met our goal, then cool. But if it was too many or too little, we're going to raise or lower the difficulty. And that is pretty much how mining works in completion. It is not any more complicated than that. It's all hashes, proofs, and a chain of custody. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Um, how long does the transaction take, and are there any timeouts? Uh, so the transactions take as long as they take. You can't you can't really estimate. Uh, well, you can only estimate, I should say, uh, because it could each time that you're doing one of these random things, you're just guessing. So each time you have the same chance to find a winning block, right? So just like you could flip a coin 100 times, and generally it's going to be 50-50, there's no reason why it can't be 70-30. You know what I mean? So you, you could just get so unlucky and just never find a block, or you could find two back to back. It could happen. <laughs> uh, but that's why the difficulty is checked at a goal, at a goal point. So they say, like, OK, cool, we've made 1,000 blocks. And we wanted that to take a week. But actually, it took two days. So now, let's double the difficulty. <laughs> and then, oops, we only generated 10 blocks this week. Let's lower it. And eventually, it comes to an equilibrium. All 
All right, so now we're going to attempt the live untested demo. So get that, get that sound effect ready. Oh, that's not okay. <laughs> you ready? You ready? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so we should be able to, uh, actually, I'm going to make it a little easier for myself. All right. So now we should be able to play with all the code that we were looking at because it's all in here now. So for example, we can say make transaction input and we can give it a previous TXID hash. In this case, I'm just going to put some not real data and an index. Um, the index is important because, as I said, you can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs in a transaction, right? So you need to know which transaction are you referencing. That's, that's the purpose of the index. Uh, and then finally, arbitrary data. So in Bitcoin, that's going to be some binary string with a bunch of like encoded data, which is going to equal a program or a script, which is usually going to say, hey, output goes here. Or as I said, sometimes it's abused for other purposes, like hiding data in the blockchain. Uh, in our case, it can be whatever we want. So uh, we're just going to say uh, Genesis Live, because we're going to use this transaction, I believe, for the Genesis block. So there we go. So now we have a transaction. Uh, we also are going to need, uh, well, strictly speaking, we'd probably want some kind of output uh, and a Coinbase transaction, but I more just want to test the miner. I assume that's probably what you guys want to see too. So I'm not going to worry too much about the correctness of what I put in this transaction. We're just going to see if it mines. Um, okay, so we've got an input, so now we need a transaction. All right, so transaction is going to be make transaction, and it's going to take this input and have no outputs. All right, so recapping, we've got a structure. It is a transaction, or TX. It has no outputs. And it has this input that we created here. It's attempting to be a genesis uh, indication. So I would normally put, for example, some data here indicating what today is and all that fun stuff. All right. So now we should be able to calculate the Merkle root on that. So let's try that. Ooh, that's wrong. And it has a problem. Ah, Th thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see if I just give it something. I want to make sure it's just broken. Okay, all right, so womp, womp, womp. Uh, it is not going to work with that, and I'm not going to live fix that right now. So we're going to move on, and if you want to see the mining demo, see me right after this. <laughs> um, and I apologize. Womp, womp, womp. All right, so as I said, there's a virtual machine involved. Typically, transaction outputs are scripts. That's essentially one of the most important takeaways that you can get from this whole discussion of what are transactions in, in a blockchain. 
Breathe a sigh of relief though, because we're not gonna be implementing all that today. Uh, but you know, you can listen to me ramble on about it a little bit anyway. Uh, what else do we use those things for? Well, in Ethereum, they do smart contracts. So they have a much more extensive virtual machine, as I mentioned. Uh, they have a whole lot of facilities, like you can say, hey, I wanna store some data here, and it'll give you an address, essentially, where you can store data, and it's all hashed and distributed over the blockchain and all that fun stuff. So it's like a little mini computer, like an Arduino or something, but in the blockchain. It's, it's pretty weird, it's pretty weird. So how would we go about breaking this? Well, you gotta think about what is controllable and how exactly is a 51% attack executed and what can you do there? So if you have more than more than half of the mining pool, the mining power, if you're generating more than half of the blocks than everybody else, you can do some nifty stuff. For example, the most famous one being a double spend attack. So how does that work? If my mining demonstration <laughs> had worked, we were then gonna do it. But what we would do essentially is you create a transaction with a node you don't control and you say, hey, I wanna send these coins over here. And they're like, sure, no problem, bro. And on the other side, on your nodes that you control, you just start building blocks. Because again, the way that consensus works is longest chain wins. So in your thing that you're doing, you send those same tokens to an address you control. So, Whoever is waiting on whatever service to see, hey, cool, I got these coins from this person, they're gonna see, hey, oh, this is confirmed, great, no problem. And they're gonna give you whatever you paid for, potentially, you're hoping. And then the hammer falls, and oh, sorry, your chain with four new blocks and a few confirmations is now preempted by my chain with eight new blocks and a bunch more confirmations. Sorry, those coins didn't actually go there. That transaction didn't happen. And that's a double spend. You literally just are able to do a shadow build of a blockchain and then say, hey, this is the real thing and everyone has to listen to you because you have the most work. <laughs> That's the face I was hoping to see. <laughs> How often does that happen? Uh, not too often. Uh, we're going to talk about the feasibility of all that stuff, but it did recently happen to uh, a Bitcoin offshoot blockchain. And as if I recall correctly, they were doing something crazy like 24 or 26 blocks deep. So people were like, oh no, yeah, it's cool. This is confirmed by 13 blocks below. Oh, nope. <laughs> so it happens, but it takes a whole lot of effort and, and money. Like uh, we'll talk about this more later, as I said. <clears throat> All right, so there are many attacks against smart contracts. Uh, these slides I believe will be available to everyone after. Uh, and that's a nice little link with a nice little article. Uh, the most basic is underflow and overflow. So as I said, there's a virtual machine in here. In Ethereum, you can make a contract where you do stuff like say, okay, I've got this public value. It's a variable. I'm gonna call it zero and I'm gonna set it to zero. And you got this other value, which is a uint. That's a like C language-y talk for an unsigned integer. So that means it should only be positive numbers. So you're gonna say, hey, this is gonna be max two to the 256 minus one. That happens to be the largest integer that that virtual machine can represent. So if you are completely unaware of this fact or have never played around with C and gotten bitten by all this stuff in the past, then you will be completely surprised to find out that zero minus one is actually two to the 256 minus one and two to the 256 minus one plus one overflows back to zero. So the numbers wrap around. So you would expect maybe some kind of error, like number out of range. Nope. It just happily processes the code. So it's basically an old school C error. 
alive on the blockchain. The next biggest thing is the DAO hack. So Ethereum did a big distributed autonomous organization thing. Um, and a very smart person read through the code and found an issue with it and exploited it for all it was worth to the point where they went back on code is law and f hard forked the blockchain to say that that guy never got his money. So how did that happen? Recursive function calls are dangerous, especially when you do work on either side of it. So <clears throat> if we imagine this is the code for the contract and these are some breakpoints, let's kind of walk through. So if we want to withdraw money from the DAO, we say, hey, I would like to withdraw some amount. And it says, okay, cool. It checks to make sure that the sender has enough money. And if it does, it uses this call to send out the money. And I believe, I, oh, sorry. And I believe this is solidity for basically saying return that amount. Now, the issue here is that this makes a recursive call, and this is where it actually subtracts the money. So the issue is that in a virtual machine, you often have a stack. And you may have heard of this website called Stack Overflow. Well, if you have too many things on the stack, the stack will overflow and stop running. So this guy found out that basically, for example, he could send in 20, 30, whatever transactions, and most of them would send out, but then the stack would crash, and it couldn't unwind and subtract the money. So he basically was getting like 20 to 1. <laughs> Another interesting smart contract attack is the ERC-20 short address attack. So there's a standard in Ethereum for making tokens on Ethereum called ERC-20. And if you're not careful with your inputs on that, people can just generate a lot more tokens than you expected them to. What they do is they generate an address with a trailing zero, which is not hard to do. You just keep throwing random data at it until you have trailing zeros rather than leading zeros. Same kind of concept as we looked at with the mining. And then you send to that address, but you remove the trailing zero. This causes a bug in the virtual machine to say, oh, okay, I, that, there must be some magnitude error here. Let me multiply by 10 on your amount. <laughs> so, you can, so you can essentially use this crafted address attack to say, hey, give me orders of magnitude more than you should. So if you have a node or a wallet, uh, you're going to want to make sure that your private keys are protected. Uh, make sure you use a passphrase. Uh, if your wallet is open, all someone has to do is get on your box and send those coins away or take the wallet because then they, they own the private keys at that point. If you instead have it passphrased and encrypted, they can't do that. Uh, also, cold storage is a good option uh, if you can if you have the, the technical ability, which isn't too hard nowadays, there's plenty of tools that'll get you started. Uh, basically, you can create an address that you can print on a sheet of paper and store that in a safe. And that is probably generally gonna be safer than an unprotected wallet sitting on your computer that any random person can steal. Uh, make sure you read the manual. Uh, there's generally going to be lots of things in your configuration that'll allow you to do things like, you know, disallow certain clients, make sure you set a password if you have RPC, all that fun stuff. Uh, if you don't, people will just find your stuff and take it. Uh, firewalls and all that kind of basic stuff, monitoring and alerting if you're running a service, for example, or if you really care about your your wallet contents, you might want to have a process that is watching that and making sure that you know your funds aren't moving unless you moved it, right? <clears throat> All right, so uh, towards your question, sir, the economic feasibility of a 51% attack is 
pretty not good in Bitcoin. Uh, to do that, you're going to need millions, probably at this point billions of dollars in electricity and gear. Uh, so it's kind of more of a problem in smaller chains. There's any random quote unquote shitcoin or altcoin <laughs> is probably not going to have enough hashing power to stop a serious miner who decides that they want to own it. So definitely tread carefully in the altcoin world. Make sure you look at the difficulty rate, the hash power, all that fun stuff. Uh, and like any other software, there's going to be patches. Make sure you stay up to date with stuff. Uh, just a few days ago, there was a Bitcoin DOS patch. Uh, basically, someone found you could send a crafted transaction, because remember, the outputs of the transactions are scripts that would actually crash the client. Uh, and then uh, a gentleman over there informed me last night that this has actually been escalated now to a possible Bitcoin infinite inflation bug, which has now been confirmed and given a CVE number. So make sure you stay up to date. And uh, kind of as I mentioned before, the protocol here has changed. The protocol is different. You know what I mean? There's no specification. They just made this big patch. The protocol has changed. So that's, that's a big deal to keep in mind to me. Uh, so how do you protect yourself in the smart contract world? Uh, avoid your interest issues. Make sure you think it all out. Make sure you do all the work before you call somewhere else because you don't know what's going to happen there. You want to make sure you know, all your ducks in a row. Uh, be careful of overflows and underflows. Think like a C programmer. Be defensive. Use a library. There's a safe math library out there that will take care of a lot of this for you. Um, make sure you're checking the links of addresses and other data. And uh, there's a nifty little thing called Ethereum Fiddle, which will let you build and test smart contracts online and test them, test them, and test them. So any questions, uh, if you're still awake, uh, if you want to talk to me, hit me up on IRC or hit us up at Null Space Labs starting at the end of October. We're going to have a Halloween party, hopefully. And of course, you can have me a drink. <laughs>
blockchain thing to do. <laughs> Uh, also, I am under the understanding that Oracle is going to come out with one. Uh, and the main things that I've heard it applied to are things, of course, like finance, kind of like settlement between banks, uh, as well as the chain of custody type things, uh, where you kind of want an immutable list of things. Uh, at the company that I work for, we're looking at this thing called Unify Vault, where they, their pitch is that they will bring all your security data into a blockchain that will act as an immutable log of what has happened to your systems, which can help you with essentially remediation in the past, and you know due to the nature of the blockchain that those logs can, have not been tampered, because if so, the blocks won't verify and such. Uh, so there's some interesting applications out there that have nothing to do with currency, I would say. Mm -hmm.